It's a Thursday morning. You just got back from your 10 a.m. lunch, and now you're sitting in fourth period sophomore English class. Your teacher, on maternity leave for the second time, left a schedule for the sub to follow. As she reads over the itinerary, you empty your backpack and put your book on the desk. Published in 1953, Fahrenheit 451 was an instant success and eventually came to be known as author Ray Bradbury's magnum opus. Set in a not too far distant future, the science fiction novel is the definition of a post-World War II dystopia. And yet it finds itself distinct from others of the same classification. Fahrenheit 451 uses its narrative as a social commentary, critiquing the direction the world was heading at the time, which in itself is nothing revolutionary. But what makes Bradbury's book so relevant today is, well, it's relevance. Fahrenheit 451 functions as a warning to the reader, aiming to bring awareness to the predominating effects of technology on our daily lives. Throughout our mentions of things like digital addiction, virtual reality, and a society lacking any sort of critical thinking. And keep in mind, this book was written over 70 years ago, not five years ago by Todd Phillips. The lessons and principles Ray Bradbury has conveyed have remained so applicable that they are still being pulled and taught to students around the country today in more ways than one, funny enough. And we have just received a copy of the complaint filed against the school by Alton Verb. In the report, he listed each objected item line by line, complete with individual page numbers. Besides bad language and violence, Verm lists downgrading Christians and talking about our firemen as reasons this book should be banned. The school committee is expected to meet about the book and we'll let you know what happens. The argument may be made that Fahrenheit 451 in this day and age is more relevant than it's ever been before. To give a little necessary context, our story revolves around the life of a firefighter named Montag, but not a firefighter as you and I know them to be. In this world, they may be referred to as book burners, whose solitary job is to burn books. In this futuristic, totalitarian America, books are seen as the pinnacle of evil. Because what do they ultimately do? They cause individual thought, bring conflicting ideas, and allow for personal reflection. I wasn't ready for this, okay? Basically everything a hierarchy wants its citizens not to do. So their solution? Burn all the books. Get rid of any form of free thinking and keep people under a blanket of censorship and control. And Montag, unbeknownst to him, is a first-hand contributor to this solution. Montag is living life really just like everyone else. He goes to work, he works, and uh, well, goes home. That's kind of it. At home, Montag is greeted by his wife, Mildred. Or maybe greeted isn't a fitting word because every mention of Mildred has her completely shut off from the real world, as she's always concerned with her electronics more than she is with the people around her. During the day, she's watching her parlor walls, which is basically a VR living room. And during the night, she's listening to her seashells, which are basically AirPods. There is literally no moment in time when she is not enamored by technology completely unaware of reality around her. In one instance, really the only instance she is ever interacting with any sort of friends, Mildred and the neighborhood wives are gathered around the parlor walls. And when Montauk shuts the screens off, they're at a loss as to what to do or what to talk about or how to even interact. The public happily obliges to a sense of superficial conformity at the expense of intellectual freedom. Characters like Mildred and her neighbors are willing to close their eyes to the life around them, shutting out any thoughts of war, poverty, or crisis, but simultaneously shutting out any solution to war, poverty, and crisis, as well as any chances of experiencing one of life's many gifts. Instead, they reserve their attention for frivolous matters taking place on a screen, lacking any real substantial value. And this isn't a poorly dated, 
um, you know, oh, my wife and her friends always watching TV, not making me dinner. No, this is everyone in town is the same way. They spend all day simply tuning out the world around them. Everyone except Clarice McClellan. Montauk first meets Clarice when he's walking home from work and she introduces herself as their new neighbor. The young girl immediately bombards Montauk with questions about his work, about fires, and, well, about everything, really. Have you ever watched the jet cars racing on the boulevards down that way? I sometimes think drivers don't know what grass is, or flowers, because they never see them slowly. If you showed a driver a green blur, oh yes, he'd say, that's grass. A pink blur, that's a rose garden. White blurs are houses, brown blurs are cows. My uncle drove slowly on a highway once. He drove 40 miles an hour and they jailed him for two days. Isn't that funny? And sad too? You think too many things. I rarely watch the parlor walls or go to races or fun parks. So I have lots of time for crazy thoughts, I guess. Have you seen the 200-foot billboards in the country beyond town? Did you know that once, billboards were only 20 feet long? But cars started rushing by so quickly, they had to stretch the advertising out so it would last. I didn't know that. But I know something else you don't. There's dew on the grass in the morning. He suddenly couldn't remember if he had known this or not, and it made him quite irritable. And if you look, there's a man in the moon. He hadn't looked for a long time. Clarice and her free-spirited thinking is practically a, a red pill mindset. But not like, you know, in a bad way. Why Sigma mills are more attractive than alpha mills. Stay tuned. People tend to turn a blind eye to Clarice and ignore what she has to say. But in the case of Montag, who actually listens, she becomes a catalyst to his new perspective on life. As he continues his typical routine, going on calls, burning reported books, the seed Clarice had planted begins to take shape. And he can't shake the feeling that something is missing from his mundane life. Montag's boss, however, Beatty, is the anchor to his muse, always whipping him back to the grim reality that is his life. Now, Beatty, while being the antagonist, is probably the most compelling character throughout the whole story. From a surface level, you don't really expect much from him. He just seems like a guy who blindly supports the system. But his character goes much deeper than just a devoted government worker. When suspicious of Montag about halfway through the story, we get a glimpse into this old book burner's past. One last thing, at least once in his career, every fireman gets an itch. What do the books say, he wonders? Oh, to scratch that itch, eh? Well, Montag, take my word for it. I've had to read a few in my time to know what I was about. And the books say nothing, nothing you can teach or believe. They're about non-existent people, figments of imagination, if they're fiction. And if they're non-fiction, it's worse. One professor calling another an idiot, one professor screaming down another's gullet, all of them running about, putting out the stars and extinguishing the sun. You come away lost. Up until this point, BD would have never admitted such a thing. Reading a book? The one thing he's been assigned to be rid of. But he can see the impact the young girl Clarice has had on Montag's mindset, and he is determined to not let it go any farther. Eventually, however, in BD's death scene, taking place near the closing chapters, he stands face to face with Montag. As Montag tries to flee from the law and the social structure, he aims a flamethrower at Beatty, thinking the words his former captain had once said to him. Don't face a problem, burn it. Oh, that's one thing to get an audience. Hold a gun on a man and force him to listen to your speech. Speech away. What'll it be this time? Why don't you belt Shakespeare at me, you fumbling snob? There is no terror, Cassius, in your threats, for I am armed so strong in honesty that they pass by me as an idle wind, which I respect not. How's that? Go ahead now, you second-hand literature. Pull the trigger. 
The final speech reveals that maybe Beatty wasn't the unwavering bureaucratic loyalist he made himself out to be. His sheer ability to quote Shakespeare's Julius Caesar at a whim shows insight to a more complex man than we're introduced to. A well-read and educated book burner, it's an oxymoron in itself. Not only that, but to look death in the eye and merely egg it on, it only proves a bitter truth. Beatty wanted to die. In the middle of the crying, Montag knew it for the truth. Beatty had wanted to die. He had just stood there, not really trying to save himself, just stood there, joking, needling, thought Montag, and the thought was enough to stifle his sobbing and let him pause for air. How strange, strange to want to die so much that you let a man walk around armed and then instead of shutting up and staying alive, you go on yelling at people and making fun of them until you get them mad and then... Beatty's final moments reveal a man grappling with his own beliefs. All of his career, all of his life, he has chosen to enforce a system that he is no longer certain of for who knows how long. And the only solution in his eyes is to be released from life altogether. Fahrenheit 451 has been taught in schools for decades now, but not without complications. The book which delves into censorship and oppression has been banned from schools in numerous states and countries around the world. For instance, Australia has banned the novel for, quote, questionable themes such as censorship, repression, and religion. So, yes, the book protesting against themes of censorship and repression has been both censored and repressed, ironically enough. But as the world, but as the world continues in the direction it's heading, Fahrenheit 451 is only becoming more and more applicable to our technological technolog to our technological progression. Screen time, screen reliance, screen addiction, whatever you want to call it is on the rise and it will only continue to rise, meaning Fahrenheit 451 will only increase in significance. The problem in our country isn't with books being banned, but with people no longer reading. You don't have to burn books to destroy a culture. You just get people to stop reading them. <laughs>